Uh, I'm Aaron Bradley with the Area Agency on Aging and Disability. There are a few people in the room that I don't recognize your face, so I thought I'd say that. It is my great pleasure to introduce our speaker today, Bryce Allen. He works with the Tennessee Department of Homeland Security. And I'm going to read part of this because I didn't have time to memorize it. Bryce basically said, take it away, Bryce, but I want to read a little bit about his background and his history. Bryce is a supervisory agent for the Tennessee Department of Safety and Homeland Security, Office of Homeland Security's Bureau of Preparedness. He began his law enforcement career as a police officer in 1999 with the city of Boca Raton, Florida Police Department. We were just talking about how close uh, he was working to the recent tragedy in Florida. Specializing in criminal intelligence gathering, tactical operations, and violent crime investigation, Bryce has held assignments in patrol, crime suppression, criminal investigations, and the Special Weapons and Tactics SWAT team. In 2011, Bryce joined the Tennessee Department of Safety and Homeland Security as an intelligent analyst assigned to the Tennessee Fusion Center responsible for coordinating daily operations, tactical intelligence, domestic terrorism analysis. In 2012, he was promoted to oversee the Department's Homeland Security Preparedness Program and is responsible for the development of Homeland Security related training and exercise programs. Bryce has a Bachelor's of Arts in Homeland Security with coursework in Emergency Management, International and Domestic Terrorism, weapon, Weapons of Mass Destruction, Terrorist Ideology and Tactics. He has authored several articles and presentations and has received numerous commendations throughout his career for his law enforcement efforts. I think you have in front of you quite an expert and Bryce, thank you so much for being here. It's all yours. Thanks, sir. I want to first thank everyone for attending and allowing me to come speak about what I consider to be a really important subject. This idea that we might find ourselves in some kind of sudden violent attack, one that we have to manage on top of everything else that's going to be going on. Now more commonly, or most commonly anyway, this is often referred to as that active shooter attack, right? The individual who is intent on harming as many people as he can in that shortest amount of time and whatever that location is. One thing I want to stress though is that while I'm talking about the active shooter and that's what we're thinking about because that's what we hear about on the television, we read in newspapers and I mean that's what we're most familiar with right now. A lot of what I'm going to be talking about, the concepts, the principles, it can be applied to other kinds of violent crime that you might find yourself in as well. Armed robberies, assaults, home invasions, carjackings, a lot of other violent crime that happens every single day can be dealt with in the same manner that I'm going to talk about. Now, of course, you need to adjust what I'm going to talk about and apply it to that unique circumstance and whatever the situation is, but nevertheless, a lot of it transfers over. And a lot of us are thinking about schools and we're thinking about our place of employment. Keep in mind that this can happen anywhere. Right? This can happen when you're simply walking across the parking lot, when you're out shopping with your family, when you're at a restaurant. No place seems to be immune from this kind of violence or any kind of violence for that matter. So while we're thinking about our place of employment, while we're thinking about what's happened recently in the news, consider the fact that this can happen both in your professional life and in your personal life. And I'll try to touch on those as we go through. Now, as you heard Aaron talking about, my background is pretty vast. I originally actually started in the military, spent several years in the Army, and then I left the Army and got into law enforcement. And as Aaron was saying, I was working in South Florida. I have actually responded to active shooter attacks from the law enforcement perspective. So I have a bit of a unique kind of understanding or a bit of experience on how these events might unfold. Now, I always say might because I can't guarantee that the bad guy's going to do certain things. I have no idea what he's going to do really. So I have to kind of adjust for whatever the situation is. Now I worked undercover for a while. I was on our SWAT team. I was a homicide detective. I faced bad guys with guns on multiple occasions. And I'll be perfectly honest with you, I'm surprised I've made it through a lot of those encounters that I had. But even with my training and my experience, regardless of what I've done, if I were to find myself in one of these kind of situations, I would be just like everybody else, at least for a period of time anyway, right? I'm going to be scared. My hands are going to shake. My heart's going to race. My knees are going to tremble. I'm probably only going to, I'm going to experience this phenomena that we call tunnel vision, where I can only see what's right in front of me. Everything else is going to go gray or even go blurry. I might not even know that something's there. My hearing's probably going to shut down. It's called auditory exclusion. I won't be able to hear someone standing right next to me screaming at me. Maybe they're telling me what to do. Maybe they're asking me what to do, but I won't even know it. 
right? That's a defense mechanism that our body does under extreme stress, but it impacts my ability to know what's going on. It impacts my ability to communicate even. And I'm going to have a very hard time making a decision. In fact, it's going to be very difficult, me to, very difficult for me to try to figure out what's happening and try to come up with my response while everything's going on. Now I know for a fact all these effects of stress are going to happen to me because they've happened to me countless times before. Right? Now there are all kinds of things you can do to mitigate the effects of stress. Right? You can get training and experience, but it all takes time. And it takes repetition. You have to go through this kind of thing over and over again. And even if you, if you don't experience something highly stressful for a period of time, you revert right back to what your natural reaction will be. I want you to understand the effects of stress because it's going to happen to everybody. So not only do you have to worry about the bad guy and what he's going to be doing, you have to worry about what's happening to you at the same time. So you have to be able to manage a lot of things going on at one single moment. And that's very difficult for people to do. Now, I like to start off, of course, with what is an active shooter. I use the federal definition because I want to paint that picture in your mind of that individual whose sole purpose is hurting people. This idea that our bad guy is an individual who's actively engaged in the killing or attempting to kill people in a confined and populated space. The most time he uses a firearm and there's no pattern or method to the selection of victims, right? That's that federal definition for the active shooter. Now I use that because it paints this picture of that individual who very little chance you can negotiate with them, right? And I hear this advice being given all the time. Maybe I can offer them something in exchange. Maybe I can talk them down. Well, the challenge with that is, what do these individuals want aside from hurting people? If they only are looking to hurt somebody, what are you going to give them in exchange? I don't personally recommend spending that time negotiating or pleading for your life because the time it takes for you to do that, you could be doing something else that has a higher probability of success. Now, I have seen it work. I'll be perfectly honest with you. But out of the situations where I have seen it work, our bad guy has either been a very young juvenile or someone of a diminished mental capacity. Very seldom do I see it work in most cases. So that's one of the reasons why I don't personally recommend it. Now I also use this definition because it's wrong. Our bad guys are changing. They're adapting. They're learning from each other. They're seeing what happens in other attacks and then they're modifying and applying it to their own as well. This idea that our bad guy will only walk into a confined and populated location like a building doesn't exist anymore. Right? We saw that in Las Vegas with a gunman who opened from fire from that hotel into that open crowd. We see gunmen get in their vehicles and they drive town to town. They simply shoot at people on the sidewalks now. Our bad guys are adapting. So don't just think it's only going to happen in an office building or in a school or some other location like that. It can happen anywhere. In addition to that, there's this idea, and it's a little bit misleading, that our bad guys will only use firearms. In fact, the name active shooter implies just that. Now, I stick with the term active shooter because it's what you know, it's what you're familiar with. But our bad guys will use any tool necessary in order to achieve that goal of hurting people. In my opinion, this is not a gun control problem. If you were to take away all the guns in our society, we would still have this exact same kind of crime. It'd be committed in a different fashion, of course, but nevertheless, it would still be happening. This is really a people problem. I think in our society, we usually ask the wrong question, right? After every major crime, we always ask how that crime was committed, right? What tool did that person use or how did they gain entry into the building? But we ever ne never, or very seldom anyway, ask the question why? Why did the bad guy do what he did? If there's a solution to this problem, it's figuring that out. It's not figuring out the tool, right? So for us, Please understand that even if our bad guy is not using a firearm, say he's using a baseball bat or a knife, or maybe he simply gets in his car and runs people over in the parking lot, your response, what you're going to do, it remains the same. It's not going to change. The only difference for you is what tells you that something bad is happening. Right? You're not going to hear gunshots if our bad guy doesn't have a firearm, but you're going to hear screaming. You're going to see people running. There'll be other indicators that'll tell you something's happening, and then you just have to react from there. There's also a bit of a misperception here, in, particularly in the United States, that this is unique to us. That this is a, truly an American problem and that other places around the world doesn't, don't experience it. The truth is, this happens everywhere. It's happening all over the globe. We just hear about it more frequently and more often when it happens in our own country. And that's part of the problem. Our media focuses intently on this kind of violent crime. In fact, we kind of glamorize it if you think about it. Now, I firmly believe that we've created some bad guys over the years. Now, 
I don't think we did it intentionally by any means, but I know that a lot of our offenders are looking for fame, notoriety, right? They want someone to understand why they're doing what they're doing. They want someone to maybe even support them and justify it for them. Well, the attention we give to bad guys, I firmly believe that if there's someone out there that's on the fence, that if someone's out there contemplating this level of violence, well then all of a sudden they see the fame and glory that that other person got. That could very well encourage them their own attack as well. Now I asked the Nashville reporter about this and I asked her what her opinion was. Does she think that we shouldn't be focusing in on the bad guy as much as we do? And she said, she agreed with me. Personally, we shouldn't be kind of putting this, the limelight on these offenders. But professionally, it was never going to change. Because in her line of work, she said that she sells infotainment. That was the word she used. She said that was the word they use in her industry. That they're not selling information anymore. It's about people clicking on the website, buying the newspapers, getting the advertising, right? It's about that bottom dollar. So unfortunately, this is something we're going to have to deal with. This is something that is going to continue to happen. And as a result, I believe we're going to see an increase of the crime over the next few years. Now, if we're lucky, it'll stay status quo. But I'll be honest with you, status quo has not really been that good. On average, we see about 16.4 attacks on an annual basis here in the United States. Right? That's a lot. So, but I expect we'll see more. One of my goals when I first started putting this presentation together was trying to figure out who is most likely going to become a violent offender. Maybe if I could figure that out, then maybe I stop the crime before it ever happens. So I looked to NYPD, I looked to Interpol, I looked to the FBI, and a number of private groups that were doing studies on violent offenders. And maybe, you know, did someone come up with a profile? Unfortunately, what we found is that there really is no profile. When we look at all of our offenders, even the ones from across the globe, we found that their race, their age, their socioeconomic background, it varied so much that it was really insignificant in helping us kind of come up with this idea of who's most likely going to use violence. Now, I did see some similarities, of course, and those similarities did tell me that most of the time it's going to be a male offender. In fact, about 96% of the time we see that it's a male that carries out this level of violence. Very seldom do we see a female. Out of the cases I'm familiar with involving female offenders, most of them worked with a male counterpart, or at a minimum was at least inspired or motivated by a male counterpart. So this seems to be truly kind of a male dominant crime. I also found that most of the time our offenders worked alone. In fact, 98% of the time. Very seldom do you see some kind of conspiracy or collaboration. Now you always hear about it, but the truth is most of the time it is that single individual. There are exceptions to every rule, of course, right? Most of us are familiar with San Bernardino, California, the husband and wife terrorist team that committed an active shooter attack, right? Exception to both of those rules. Then about a year or so before that, there was also another husband and wife team that walked into a Las Vegas Walmart and opened fire in there after assassinating two police officers who were eating lunch across the street. Again, exceptions to both rules. But generally speaking, if I were to find myself in this kind of violent attack, odds are I'm dealing with that true lone gunman, right? That's the highest probability for me. Unfortunately, he's probably prepared though. He's probably spent a significant amount of time planning out his attack. We have seen some of our, our offenders spending days, weeks, months, and in some cases even years coming up with what they want to happen. We see them put obstacles or barriers or defenses in place to slow down people from escaping or slowing law enforcement down from responding. Back in 2007, there was a gunman who walked on the campus of Virginia Tech. When he walked into Norris Hall, the building on campus, he brought a dozen chains and paddle locks with him. He walked into that building, he started chaining all the doors shut behind him. He started trapping his victims in the building with him. Now a byproduct of that plan, of course, was he also locked the police out of the building. It took almost an hour for law enforcement to finally force their way into that building in an effort to stop him. By then, he had already killed everybody he wanted to and had taken his own life. That was such a successful plan that we've seen it copied about a half a dozen times since then throughout the years. Our bad guys study each other. In fact, they research each other and then they copy what works and, tries to, and try to become more deadly. I would imagine that after the Florida shooting, we're going to see a series of more threats and possible other attacks as well because that motivates people out there, right? And they've learned from it. They've seen what worked in that Florida attack and they're able to take things and apply it to theirs, just like the Vegas attack and all the ones that we've seen most recently. 
If you remember that federal definition, they said that there was no pattern or method to the selection of victims. So that implies to me that it's truly random, that there's no reason why the bad guy targets where he does. That's actually, again, not true. If we dig far enough back in our offender's history, we start to think like the offender, we find that most often they attack locations in which they are community members. Now, that means it might be where they work. It might be where they go to school. It might be some place of entertainment that they frequent. But it usually is some place that they're fairly comfortable with. Now, there are a lot of reasons for it, of course, but the overwhelming reason seems to be that they are targeting somebody. That there is someone there that did something to them, or they perceive that that person did something to them, and now they want revenge. Right? They, they want to fix whatever they think their problem is. Now, that very specific relationship could be the person who gets reprimanded or disciplined by their superior, right? It could be the kid who gets bullied at school. It could be any number of reasons out there why the person does what they do, right? That's a very specific relationship. On occasion, we're also finding that our bad guys will target locations based on a symbolic relationship. Meaning, let's say I'm the bad guy and I'm angry at an organization or an agency or a company because they took a service away from me or they denied something that I believe I'm entitled to. So now I come back and I target that entire organization. And the first person I see, well, that person represents whatever it is I don't like. We also see that happen occasionally with groups of people, or we see that happening with people from certain backgrounds or demographics, right? We saw that in Orlando, Florida. The man that walked into that nightclub and targeted a specific group of people because he didn't like them. He didn't know them personally, but they represented what he didn't like. Again, that's a symbolic relationship, but nevertheless, it is still a relationship. It doesn't happen as often, of course, but it still does. So it is something we need to think about. Understand that this is a violent attack by its given nature, right? That's what kicks the whole thing off is violence. It is most likely going to end in some kind of violent manner as well. Almost an equal amount of time, we find that our offender will either take their own life or attempt to take their own life, or somebody will step in and stop them. It's what we call that applied force or third-party intervention. Now, as much as I hate to admit it, that third party intervention more than likely will not be law enforcement. Right? It's our job, it's our goal, that's what we intend on doing. But the reality is when we look at how long these attacks last, they really don't last that long. National average is about five to 10 minutes for an active shooter attack here in our country. And some studies are now showing that average is actually going down to about four to seven minutes. Now there are some attacks, of course, take hours. Some take seconds, right? which is why we have that average. But generally speaking, you can imagine that somewhere under that 10 minute time frame, the active part of the attack is probably over with. Now that's a little bit misleading. Take for example, what if you get hurt in the first two minutes? Or what if someone you care about is hurt in the first two minutes? Well, that means the attack for you or for them is gonna last much longer than 10 minutes, right? Because you still need assistance, you need aid, you need someone to help you. But the reason that becomes significant is because when we look at how long it takes law enforcement to get there, our response time is about the same. National response time is five to 10 minutes. You might have police officers out in the front parking lot in 30 seconds. That just means they're in the parking lot. That doesn't mean they can successfully and effectively stop the bad guy in that same amount of time. There are all kinds of reasons and factors that might come into play on why it takes law enforcement a, a period of time to stop the bad guy. Take for example, back, um, I think it was in 2013, there was a gunman who walked onto the campus of the United States Navy Yard. He walked in one of those buildings on that complex and he opened fire in the building. Law enforcement response was zero seconds. They were actually standing in the building when the attack started. By the time that attack ended, there were 117 police officers in that building. That attack lasted for 48 minutes. So for almost an hour, you had one gunman who was able to avoid over 100 police officers and still hurt people. Like, how's that even possible, right? How could that happen? Our bad guy worked in that building. He knew his way around. He had a scan card that allowed him to bypass every single locked door and security feature that was put in place to stop bad guys just like him. So when he would get to a locked door, he would simply scan his way through it and then close the door behind him. When the police officers got to that locked door, they didn't have scan cards. They had to break that door down, they had to, get an, they had to find an access card, they had to find another way around, and all that took time. 
all that was time that worked against law enforcement stopping the bad guy. This can happen to any of us, right? We might be in a location that has locked doors, security features designed to stop bad guys, but yet the bad guy can bypass them and law enforcement can't. Or you might be in a location that is so big that law enforcement doesn't know where to start and they simply have to start at the front door and systematically work their way around. Or they might not even know their way around the facility. Think about a large shopping mall. Think about a hospital. Think about a large office building. All of these locations take time and depending on how many police officers show up is depending on how effective we can be slowing the bad guy down. So this means for a period of time you're going to be on your own. I don't know how long that period of time will be, of course, right? It might be seconds, might be minutes, might be much longer. But generally speaking, there will be a period of time where you have to be your own first responder. You have to make decisions for yourself in order for you to survive that situation and manage it. So how do we do this, right? Now I told you under severe stress, under extreme levels of stress, you're gonna have a very hard time making a decision. So we need to come up with our plan now because you don't wanna be caught in that situation trying to come up with a plan, trying to figure out what you need to do on top of everything that's going on. So we try to address that by coming up with our plan right now. Now there are a couple things that you can do to start framing your plan together and that's for every location you walk into, try to identify your emergency exits and your escape route to that exit. Now one thing I want to caution you about identifying exits, it is natural human habit to go back to the last point of entry into any location that you're most familiar with. So under stress, most people are going to run back to that front door, right? Because that's what they know, that's what's common, right? But think about a facility like this. I'm guessing there's probably more than one way in and out of this facility, right? So that means if 200 people and everyone tries to charge one door in a Walmart on a Saturday afternoon, unless you're the first guy to that door, odds are you're not going to successfully get out, right? But think about a Walmart facility, they probably have a half a dozen, if not more, ways in and out, right? Employee entrances and loading docks and back doors, right? So try to identify more than one entrance and exit out of a facility and the route you're going to take to get there because you don't know what's going to happen to that primary one. It could be blocked, right? It could be, you know, locked. Any number of things could happen. Now, in addition to identifying those exits and, and escape routes, try to identify what I call an area of protection some place that you can go for safety. Even if that place for safety is only good for 30 seconds until you can get to one of those other two, right? It is better than nothing. Now, this does seem a little paranoid, right? Every location I walk into, I try to identify my escape routes out of there. I would argue I'm not being paranoid at all. I'm actually being prepared to deal with any possible emergency. And what I mean by that, let's just take a fire, for example. If there was a fire in this building right now, We'd want to know all three of those things, right? I'd want to know how to get out of here. If I couldn't get out of here, i want to know where I'd go for safety until I could. What if there's a storm outside? I still want to know all three, right? I might not want to know them in this order, but I want to know where I can go for safety until that storm passes, and then I want to know how I can evacuate the building, particularly if the building's been damaged during that storm, right? So again, all I'm doing is preparing myself for any possible emergency. We just happen to be talking about the guy with the gun right now. Now, in addition to that, you should always carry a mechanism or a tool or have some way to communicate with people what's going on, right? A way to call for help, a way to alert your family and friends that you're okay after the situation is over with. Now, fortunately, technology is really taking care of this for us, right? The cell phone solves that problem. As long as I have this device with me, right, I've taken care of having that tool and mechanism to alert people to what's going on. Now, of course, there are rules to this. Right? And there are rules that all of us break all the time. We actually have to charge that thing. I know it sounds simple, right? But how many of us get in our car, right? we're going to work, and we look at the phone, and it's got the little glowing red light in the corner of our screen. And we're thinking, well, I'll charge when I get to the office, or I'll charge it later, and then we forget. Halfway through the day, it's got 1% or 2% battery on it, or it dies altogether. Right? That's not going to help me if I need it, though. Or what about this, right? We simply just forget it. We leave it on our desk when we run down the hall, or I'm just going down to the, you know, the corner store on the weekend. You know, if my boss calls me, I'm not going to answer it anyway, right? We think we're just going to be gone for a second, and I don't need it. What if that's the second when all of a sudden the guy with the gun walks through the door and starts shooting, right? So we need to make sure we have that device ready and accessible for us to use at all times. Again, I'm just talking about any possible emergency, though. 
If I get in a car accident this afternoon, I'm going to need that. I'm going to need to call for assistance in order to deal with that problem. So again, all we're doing is talking about the guy with the gun right now. Now, in addition to having a plan, you need to practice that plan. You need to make it intuitive. You need to make it a habit. We can talk about it right now, but if you never use what we come up with for a year, two years, three years, maybe even five years, odds are you're not going to remember it. So we need to make it routine. We need to make it kind of instinctual. Now, the one thing about practice, of course, is it doesn't have to be complicated. Now, at the organizational level, I'm all for, you know, having exercises and drills, right? But at the individual level, I can practice every single day, multiple times a day, in fact. And it doesn't have to be kind of an interference at all in my normal routine. I simply play the what if game. What if a bad guy were to walk through those front doors right now and we heard the gunshots? What if we went to look out that door to investigate what's going on and all of a sudden we see the bad guy coming in our direction? Now we have to come up with a plausible response, of course, to the what if, but that's rehearsal, right? I was actually trained to do this when I was a rookie police officer. I was taught to play what if. What if I'm driving to a 911 call and I get there and the bad guy does this or he does that? What if I get there and the call's not even what I thought it was going to be when I arrived? What if, what if, what if? Again, I have to think of all possibilities I might encounter and come up with a response. That's mental rehearsal. That is practice. If I've thought about it and I come up with, formulate some kind of way to deal with it, I'm more likely to apply that response properly. You also need to share your plan with people that need to know. Now this is critical. If you think about the work environment, this is new staff, new employees, interns, temporaries, you know, whatever my unique situation is. In my personal life though, this is my family. This is my friends. This is people that I care about. If I'm out in public and the guy with the gun walks in and, starts, and I know exactly where to go and what to do because I planned it out and I've rehearsed it in my mind, but yet my family doesn't, well then my plan was a failure, right? It didn't work because I failed to tell people that I care about the most on what they need to do as well. And in my opinion, this is a solution or part of a solution to this kind of problem, but it is long term. How I deal with people is very important. If I deal with people in a respectful or even professional manner, then I am less likely to create those grievances against my, me, right? I'm less likely to make people angry at me and have them lash out because they feel they need to fix some problem, right? Get revenge against me. Now, depending on your situation, this might be difficult to do. Like take, for example, my professional life, right? In law enforcement, I make decisions every single day that people are not happy with. They assume I'm making those decisions because of some personal dislike I have for them. It doesn't matter that maybe the law is forcing me to do it or the situation is forcing me to do it. They just assume it's because I don't like them. Right? So it's just difficult, right? People get mad at me in my professional life every day. But what about my personal life though? I would argue in my personal life, this is extremely easy for everybody to do. It's a matter of treating people the way you want to be treated, right? Not getting angry, maybe even getting emotional about something that's not that big of a deal. Let's take for example, you get on the highway, you get behind the wheel of your car, you're driving in traffic, and if you're like me, your entire personality changes the minute you all of a sudden find yourself in that situation, right? Someone cuts you off in traffic, and next thing you know, you're white knuckling the steering wheel, maybe you cut them off, you flash your lights at them, maybe give them an inappropriate wave as you go by, right? <laughs> How is that other person going to react, though? You have no idea what that other person's going to do because they might be in that exact same state of mind when all of a sudden you create that conflict. Well, what about if you're in a parking lot, right? Particularly around the holidays is when I see this the most. You're in a parking lot and you're waiting for that last parking space. You got your blinker on, you're waiting patiently, and the guy in the SUV steals your parking space. Again, we find people get out there and they want to correct the problem, right? They want to tell that person just how wrong they are for taking their parking space. This creates conflict, right? People react in amazing ways under that kind of stress. Just last year after the holidays, right around Thanksgiving, we saw a man, two men arguing in a Walmart over a parking space. One guy pulls a knife, stabs the other, and then grabs a rifle from his car and starts shooting at random people in the parking lot, right? All started over an argument on a parking space. If you treat people in a manner that doesn't create that conflict for no particular reason, then I argue you reduce the number of chances of becoming a, a target of some kind of violence. 
Because I can tell you that for a fact, our attackers do not just snap. There is a buildup. There's a cycle of violence that all potential violent offenders go through. And if we're paying attention, we can actually see indicators along the way. Now, back in 1984, there was a man who walked into a McDonald's just outside of San Diego in California. Walked in that McDonald's, shot and killed 21 people, injured an additional 19. Now, what makes his crime particularly bad, in my opinion, even compared to some of the crimes we see today, is that for years before his attack, he told his family, his friends, and his co-workers exactly what he was going to do when he lost his job. He told them that he wasn't going out alone. He was going to take people with him. That's how he put it. And the day he was fired, he went home, he grabbed a duffel bag, filled it full of guns, and as he was leaving his house, his wife asked him where he was going. He told her that society had its chance and he was going to go hunt humans. Left his house, went straight to McDonald's, and committed his attack. When the police did their investigation, they asked everybody, why didn't someone come forward? Why didn't someone warn us about this? The response we saw, even back in the 80s, is still the exact same response we see today. People denied the problem, or they justified the problem, or they simply ignored it. Right? They made comments like, well, I thought he was just kidding. I thought he was venting, letting off steam. Right? Or, well, you know, he's really a nice guy when you get to know him. Or, I didn't want to be on his list, so I figured I wasn't going to say anything. Right? We still hear that today. Indicators of potential violence are nothing more than behavioral changes in somebody. Something that tells us that something is happening with that person. That they're under a high level of stress and they're not managing that stress very well. Now just because we see these stress indicators, of course, it doesn't guarantee the person's going to become a violent offender, but it does tell us that something is going on and they're not managing it very well. So I look at it from this point of view. If I recognize these stress indicators in someone, right, I see these behavioral changes, then maybe I help that person. Right? Maybe I step in and I do something to help that person get through that rough patch in their life. Maybe they were never going to become a violent offender and I help them anyway. Right? To me, that should be enough to pay attention to these kind of behavioral changes and these indicators. Maybe I break the cycle before it ever gets to any becoming much worse. Now, these behavioral indicators I'm talking about may include an increased use of alcohol or drugs. Maybe an increase of unexplained absenteeism or even vague physical complaints. There may be noticeable decreases in appearance and hygiene, or resistance and overreaction to change in policy and procedure, and more importantly, repeated violations of that policy and procedure when they know that that change has been made. It could be severe mood swings, or maybe explosive outbursts of anger or rage for really or little or no reason. Right? If I start seeing several of these occurring in somebody, I know something is going on with that person. I just don't know what. Now, there are other indicators, right? And these behavioral indicators, to me, are much more concerning but maybe I still miss them. Maybe I miss them because I'm simply not looking for them, or maybe I'm choosing to ignore them. And they can include suicidal comments. Maybe even that suspect or paranoid behavior, you know, that attitude that everybody hates me, everyone's out to get me. They can increasingly talk about their problems from home or at work, or worse yet, they start talking about acts of previous violence that they've seen or read about or heard about. They start to understand with the bad guy. They start to get why he did what he did. They could have their escalation of domestic problems, or maybe they start talking about firearms, violent crime, or other dangerous weapons. And then there's that, in today's day and age, that social media display, right? Now, the social media display is really nothing more than kind of a modern twist on what we've always seen. But because of the accessibility now to that platform, it's kind of being applied in a different manner. And what I mean by that is in that cycle of violence, our bad guys go through what we call the fantasy stage. They get to a point where they daydream or imagine or fantasize about what is going to happen or what they think is going to happen. And in the past, before social media, we would often find that fantasy would be written out in a diary. It would be written out in a journal or a letter even. It was what we called their manifesto. And we almost always found it after the fact. Today with social media, we find a lot of our offenders feel very comfortable going online. They'll go online and write that fantasy out. Maybe they'll make threats. And we find, more often than not, that that fantasy will be put out there before the attack is actually being committed now. If you see some online threat, whether it's specific, whether it's implied, whether it's some kind of fantasy about something going on, 
I encourage you to come forward and say something to someone. And the reason being is that in that cycle of violence, that typically only thing left after the fantasy itself is the actual attack. I would rather be wrong and investigate something, look into it, and find out that there was nothing behind it than ignore the problem, find out later I could have done something to stop it. Now, a few years ago, there was a college kid who walked onto a community college campus up in Oregon. The night before his attack, he, act, he went online and he was in a chat room with fellow students. He told his fellow students not to go to school the next day. He told them exactly where he was going to go, exactly what he was going to do. He warned everybody to stay away. Now, what makes this bad, though, is that the other students on this internet chat room, they didn't say anything to anybody. Instead, they started giving this kid advice. They started saying, no, if you want to hurt people, go here first. Don't go there. Target this individual. This is how you can hurt more people. Now, I don't know if those other students thought this was a joke or a hoax or whatever they believed, but I know that our bad guy warned them. And we potentially could have stopped him had somebody come forward and said something. This is why it's critical that we take these kind of online threats or fantasies very seriously now. Now, in addition to behavioral indicators, of course, there are actual physical indicators that I can see occurring in somebody when I am talking to them face to face. If I'm in some kind of interaction with somebody and that person is becoming under that high level of stress and that stress is starting to overwhelm them, I can actually see changes in their physical presence simply as a result of that situation and the stress buildup. It's a result of adrenaline, right? They can't even control it. Now, I've learned about these countless encounters with people in highly stressful situations when I was a patrol officer. And I'll be perfectly honest, I missed them on several occasions and found myself reacting to the problem. It's important that if you can pick up on these, that maybe you can de-escalate the situation, right? Maybe you can control it. Maybe you can put the person in a better situation. Maybe you've probably missed something along the way and you have to separate yourself, right? But it's better that you pick up on it before the problem occurs and not being left to react to it. And these physical changes I'm talking about might be a change to that person's complexion. Maybe their face goes flush, maybe even goes pale. They might start sweating for no explainable reason. Maybe they'll pace, become restless, or have what I call repetitive movements. They may physically begin to tremble and shake as that adrenaline starts to overwhelm the muscles in their body. Their jawline will tighten. Maybe their fists will even start to clench. They'll have exaggerated or violent gestures, right? Maybe they'll start talking big with their hands. Maybe they'll even start shaking that clenched fist at you or aggressively pointing at you while they're talking. Their breathing typically changes, right? It becomes rapid, becomes shallow. As their heart races, it impacts the respiratory system. They'll scowl at you, sneer at you. Maybe they'll even start using abusive language when we're assuming that wasn't how they always talk, of course. They may glare at you. Maybe they'll avoid eye contact. Now, avoiding eye contact, in my experience, is a little more common. Usually, that is a result of the person just accepting what they think is inevitable, right? In their mind, they're thinking they have no other choices left, and that usually translates into them looking around the room, just kind of coming to acceptance with what they think they need to do. And then, of course, they may violate your personal space. They may try to get as close as they can to you in order to affect that attack. Now, we find that happens regardless of the weapon the bad guy chooses to use. We see that happening with firearms, and we see that happening with fists. It doesn't seem to matter. I believe that is a psychological response and not really a physical effectiveness response, right? And I believe that because as a bad guy, I want to be dominant. I want to be powerful. I want to be the one in control. So if I can impose my will on my victim, right, if I can close that distance, particularly if I'm physically bigger than them, then I can, f I can become controlling, right? I can become dominant, right? It reassures myself that I can pull off whatever it is I think I'm going to do. So now if I'm talking to somebody and I see two or three of these start to occur, that tells me something is going bad with that interaction and I need to change something or I need to get myself out of there. Now, none of those three lists, of course, diagnose violent tendencies. There are no guarantees. But it does tell me that something is going on and I need to pay attention to it. Now, I can talk about indicators, of course, but I guarantee that at some point in your life, you've probably seen them. You may not have recognized them, but I bet most of us have probably seen these indicators over our lives. Now, this short video clip will actually illustrate exactly what I've been talking about. I'm the one who works for it. I'm a lawyer. Do something about it.
Yeah, she's cleaning the house too. What are you blind? Hey, this is my parking space. Come on, Mark. I got here before you did. Mark, there are plenty of other parking spaces back there. Mind your own business. This is between me and her. Look, you saw me use a turn signal. It's ridiculous to get upset over a parking space. consistent complaints about your aggressive behavior and that type of behavior is not acceptable here. Do you understand? I also need to speak with you about your performance lately. Your work quality has been very poor and we've decided that we need to place you on a probationary period of one month. We'll be evaluating you weekly and at the end of that period if we don't see some significant improvement then there will be some serious consequences. Mark, you could lose your job over this. Fine. Do you want to discuss this further? I'm happy to answer any questions you have. No. Are we done here? Yes. We're done. I'm sure everyone recognized the number of those behavioral and physical indicators in our fictional bad guy up there, right? You saw how he got angry over that parking space, right? Slammed his hand down the hood, sped away in the vehicle, right? You even probably saw the two characters in the beginning who went through the process of denying, justifying, and ignoring the problem, right? Really one of the nice guys around here. I know he's going through a messy divorce. I don't want to spend all day in HR, right? Those are the exact same things that we hear and see every single day. And as he was talking, our bad guy was talking to that supervisor, right? You saw his jawline tighten up, fist clench, eyes looking around the room, right? All indicators of stress starting to overwhelm our bad guy. Now, I would imagine, of course, had this been a real scenario, that at some point in the process, he probably was displaying those indicators long before it ever got to this point, right? And had someone been paying attention, potentially someone could have stepped in and broken that cycle and not be dealing with the situation. Now, of course, indicators are only good in somebody you deal with on a fairly regular basis, right? You have to see the change. 
Well, what happens if the bad guy is a true stranger? What if it's that Saturday afternoon and I'm out shopping with my friends and family and all of a sudden the guy with the gun walks through the door of that store with the intent of hurting everybody? Is there a way for me to identify somebody that is carrying a concealed weapon that potentially poses some kind of danger to me or others? Now, these signs of a concealed weapon I'm going to talk about, they are displayed by everybody. Right? So that's my warning to you. Just because you identify someone you, that you believe is armed, it doesn't mean they're the bad guy though. It might be a law-abiding citizen, might be an off-duty police officer, might be military personnel, might be a bad guy. Right? Everybody that carries a concealed weapon displays these exact same indicators to varying degrees. And of course the variance in there is because of how comfortable they are, what their intention is, how much stress they're under. What I have seen in my years of law enforcement is that typically somebody that is at a high level of stress, right, and someone has the intention of doing something bad, displays these indicators a little more frequently or a little more obviously, right? Because they're nervous, they're scared, they're tense. So that helps you identify them a little easier. Now, again, I have to caution you, because this be, can be seen in everybody, this is simply about awareness, right? I don't want you to call the police every time you see somebody you think is armed. I don't want you tackling that person to the ground. I don't want you running away screaming, right? It is simply about you being more aware of what's going on around you so that you can react a little bit faster if that person does something that becomes a danger to you. Now, one of the most frequent ones that I've found out there, ones that I see the most often, is what I call the security check. It's the touching or bumping or adjusting of the weapon wherever it's concealed on the body. It's the blouse of the jacket or shirt that's concealing it to make sure that it's not hung up and that it's still hiding that weapon. Now, in most people who are not nervous, who are not under any degree of stress, it's a, just a simple pat, a button touch with the arm. Maybe it's a blouse of the jacket one time, right? It's pretty subtle. It's very hard to pick up on. But what we find is that when someone's nervous, when someone's apprehensive, maybe they're scared, it's a constant touching of that weapon, right? Because every time I touch the weapon, it reassures me, right? Psychologically, I'm tough, I'm brave, right? It gives me confidence. So that's what I pick up on. If I'm the only guy in the crowd doing this all the time, you have to wonder what's wrong with me, right? That gets your attention. Now, it doesn't guarantee anything, but it'll get your attention and you can start looking for something else that reinforces that suspicion. And maybe how I'm dressed, what I'm wearing at that moment might also reveal something. If I'm dressed that's inappropriate or doesn't fit with the conditions or the circumstance or the location, then that might tell you something as well. If it's 90 degrees out and I walk in here wearing multiple layers of clothing, baggy overcoat, right? It's easy to conceal things under that, but I also don't fit in, right? It could be a fashion statement, but nevertheless, it gets your attention. If it's 12 degrees out and I walk in and my jacket's wide open, right? Everyone else is obviously cold, I'm obviously cold. Is that open for a reason? Is there something under my jacket I want to be able to access very quickly, right? All indicators of something that is different that gets your attention. And depending on how that garment is hanging on me, right? It might also reveal something. Now I call it jacket sag to simply illustrate my point, but any garment of clothing will do this, right? A sweatshirt, pair of pants, doesn't matter. If I stick something heavy in one side of my coat over the other, it will cause my coat to hang unevenly, right? My handgun will do that. So won't my three cell phones though. Right? But odds are, I'm probably not nervous about my cell phones. If I have my cell phones in my pocket when I walk in and my jacket's swinging on one side or it's hanging lopsided, I probably don't care that much, right? Because I don't have any bad intent with those cell phones. But if it's my handgun and I'm trying to hide it, I'm trying to conceal it, I'm trying to get inside that location to do whatever it is I'm there to do, I don't want you noticing this. So maybe I brace the side of my coat so it doesn't swing when I walk. Maybe I shield it so that if you get too close to me, I'm kind of hiding it from you. Or maybe I brace my jacket so it doesn't hang unevenly, right? I start coupling a security check with a jacket sag, right? I start combining indicators together. And let's face it, there's nothing on the human body shaped like a gun, right? So if you see that bulge or that distinctive outline of that weapon concealed underneath my jacket or under my shirt when I turn and bend just right. Well, that's a telltale sign, obviously, right? And if I have that gun in this pocket and that weight of the, the gun is hanging against my jacket, well, that's going to leave some kind of outline or bulge as well. Something that you can cue in on, something to get your attention. 
I've even picked up on bulges and outlines of weapons and backpacks before, purses, duffel bags. Depending on what else is in there, of course, pushing that weapon against the fabric, you might be able to see that as well if you're looking for it. And then nothing says gun like the gun, right? The guy who walks in with the weapon simply on their hip or in their hand. The challenge with this, of course, is that when we see people open carry legally and lawfully, right, we start to become desensitized to it. Right? We start to notice it less and less because it's common. Good example is how many of us really even pick up on the people that are carrying pocket knives nowadays, right? You see that little metal clip hanging out over their pocket? That is so commonplace that I would bet most of us, we simply just kind of look right over it now because it's what we expect to see, right? It doesn't seem unusual anymore. So that becomes a challenge when we start seeing more and more people open carry, conceal, or can carry weapons. We're going to eventually start to kind of glaze over it. Now, one thing I have noticed, though, of course, is that most of our bad guys, they simply just have the gun in their hand when they walk through the front door because they know what they're there to do. They don't want anything slowing them down. Believe it or not, we still miss that, though, too, because a lot of people in our society suffer from what I call a 45 degree problem. We walk around with our head down at about a 45 degree angle looking at our phone. Right? We're checking our email, our texts, we're playing on the Internet, we're doing whatever it is we're doing, but we're not looking around. Right? I have video surveillance of an armed robbery in Miami, Florida. The gunman is walking in the door of this convenience store with his gun in his hand. He's not even trying to hide anything. As he's walking through the front door of that convenience store, another customer is exiting at the exact same time. The other customer holds the door open for the guy with the gun. And you see on the video that the customer simply bumps the door open with his hip and the whole time is texting. And the guy with the gun simply walks right by him. Now I'm sure that customer saw something in his peripheral vision, but he didn't identify what it was and the bad guy simply walked right in. It happens all the time. So now I encourage people, look up, look around. I've interviewed countless violent offenders throughout my career and they've all told me the same thing. They chose their victim on how easy it was for them to get the advantage of that person. So if they were able to get close to their, their intended victim without their victim even seeing them, they gave them the upper hand. So now if I see somebody 50 yards or 100 yards away, well then I took that advantage away from the bad guy. So I right there start reducing my chance of becoming a victim simply by paying better attention to my surroundings. Now, I did warn you, of course, that even if I pick up on someone who might be carrying a concealed weapon, well, that doesn't mean they're the bad guy, though, right? So is there some kind of behavior or action, something that that person might do that tells me that they're a threat? Now, every violent offender I have seen, whether dealt with in real life or have watched countless hours of video surveillance on, they all do the exact same thing. And I've seen this occurring in both trained and untrained people. They all do what we call palming. Now, palming is nothing more than getting their weapon in the palm of their hand ready to go. I have never once seen a bad guy walk into a location, throw their jacket back Hollywood style, and draw the gun in a split second. That's never happened. What I always find is that the bad guy will rest their hand on their weapon. Maybe they'll reach under their jacket. Maybe they'll draw it all together and hide it under their other arm, behind their leg, or behind some other object. But they always get the weapon in their hand and ready themselves before they commit their attack. They might only do it a second before they commit their attack, but it always happens. Part of it is an effectiveness thing, right? If I have the weapon ready to go, I'm more effective. But more importantly, it's also a psychological thing. The minute I put that weapon in my hand, whether it's the knife or whether it's the gun, it now makes me a tough guy, right? It makes me brave. It reassures me. It gives me confidence. That's why we see this happening. So if I'm somewhere and I see a guy walk in, I see that telltale bulge under his jacket, and I see him staring at somebody in the room intently like no one else even exists, right? Tunnel vision, that other indicator of stress we already talked about. And then I see him start to close the distance between himself and that other person, right? Other indicator we already talked about. And then I see him reach under his jacket and rest his hand in the vicinity of where I saw that telltale bulge. Well, that tells me in my experience that something is going to happen. I don't exactly know what, but something's going to happen. It's probably nothing I want to be involved in, right? And I'm probably going to have to do something. I'm going to have to react. I'm going to have to respond in a split second when whatever it is occurs, right? So I have to be ready. So what's your response going to be? I would argue that your response is going to be solely based on one thing. Who are you at that given moment? Are you responsible for somebody else? 
or are you only responsible for yourself? You're going to have a much different response if you are by yourself and you're only responsible for yourself or, with, or if you're with someone else that you feel responsible for. You might have your own personal moral code that says, I'm going to protect my fellow man even if I've never met them before. You may be of the opinion that if you see me running, you just better keep up, right? It's fine. You have to decide for yourself what your level of responsibility is. No one can tell you if you're right or wrong. Now, of course, you have to make that decision in a split second. I do caution you that whatever decision you decide to make, it needs to be done to protect lives. Now, whether that's your own life or the life of somebody else, that's up to you. But it should be to protect lives. I also want to take a moment and address what I call preconceived notions. This idea that I know exactly how I'm going to react each and every time if I find myself in one of these situations. And I'll be perfectly honest with you. Guys like me are guilty of this. Guys who have training, guys who have experience, maybe even have the carry the tools necessary to do something. Right? We think we're going to react a certain way each and every time. I wish that were true. No one knows for a fact how they're going to react in one of these situations until they're in it. Even someone, if you've been through something before just like it, you might react differently the next time around. You might just simply be caught off guard. Right? I could be in here talking right now to you guys, and a guy with a gun could walk through that door and open fire. And I hope that my training and experience is going to kick in. But I might be facing this way when it happens. And now all of a sudden, I got to orient myself to that threat. I got to observe what's happening. I need to make a decision. I need to act all within a split second. Am I that good? I hope I am. But I don't know that for a fact, right? I might simply just be caught unaware and off guard, and my reaction might be delayed, right? It could happen. I don't know what's exactly going to happen, regardless of what I've been through. Or, let's take for example, I might be in a situation where there's a circumstance that I didn't consider when I, all of a sudden I came up with this, how am I going to respond? Now, you heard about my background, right? You heard about my professional experience. Well, what about my personal life, though? I'm married, and I have a six-year-old daughter. So what happens if it's just her and I? What if it's just my daughter and I, and we're out in public, and all of a sudden the guy with the gun walks through the door and starts shooting? Am I the former soldier? Am I the police officer? Am I the counterterrorism agent? Am I anything in my professional life? Or am I just a dad? Yeah, I'm a dad, right? And everything I thought I was going to do based on my training and my experience, it doesn't matter at that moment for me. It's only about protecting her. Because what else am I going to do, right? I'm not going to go, wait right here, daddy's going to go get in a gunfight, right? No. I only care about protecting her then, right? So that circumstance changes everything on what I thought I was going to do. This can happen to all of us, right? We might find ourselves in a situation where something changes our pre-planned response. So how do we address this, right? How do we deal with all this? We know these attacks can happen anywhere. We know the circumstances might be unpredictable. And we know the bad guy's driven to hurting as many people as they can. So we have options. We have choices. Now the options I'm going to give you are, the, are given in the order that I think works the best. And it's based on what I've seen other people do, and it's based on other events that have happened. You may not like my order. Right? You may choose a different order. You may decide you like one option over the other. You may find the bad guy forces you to change the order, or maybe forces you to go back and forth between options. Ultimately, it's going to be up to you, but this is the order that I think works. <coughs> now, the first option is ridiculously simple. In fact, it is so simple, most people think, I can't believe they actually brought someone in here to tell us to do exactly what I'm going to do anyway. I am getting out of there. I am not hanging out for anybody. I am running. Believe it or not, most people won't run. In fact, most people do the exact opposite. Most people freeze. Most people simply stand there and do absolutely nothing trying to process and accept what's going on. In fact, this is so common that they call it normalcy bias. We are conditioned by society to expect certain things in certain locations. And if something happens that's outside what we consider to be normal, then it throws us off, right? We have to accept it. We have to realize what's going on. We got to recognize it. We got to 
you know, process it and we, we each got to come to terms with it. In fact, our mind will actually start to play tricks on us. It will try to apply a more rational explanation to what's going on. And this is why you always hear about witnesses and victims who say, well, I heard the gunshots and I thought it was fireworks. I thought it was a car backfiring. I thought someone dropped something in the hallway from my office, right? Because they have nothing in their experience that they can apply to that situation. So they're trying to apply whatever seems most plausible based on their experience. This happens all the time. We need to come to terms with what's going on and we need to move as fast as we can. Now, preferably, you get out of the building, get a half a mile down the street, right? That's where you're going to be safe. Reality tells me you're probably only going to be able to get out of the hallway where the guy with the gun is. Maybe get into an adjacent room. Maybe get around the corner, right? If you're in, an if you're in a big parking lot, maybe you get down behind a car, right? But as soon as you start moving, you start regaining control of the situation. So you have to move to some area of relative safety in order for you to start processing what's going on and making better decisions from there, right? Now, preferably, of course, once you're safe, I want you to call for help, right? But here's my exception to that rule. If, it's, if it risks your safety or anybody else's safety, don't make the phone call. Don't slow down your response to make that call. You can always make it later. Now, what happens, of course, if you can't run? What happens if you can't evacuate? Maybe you're with somebody that they can't evacuate and you decide you have to stay behind to protect them. Maybe you just can't because you're physically unable to, or maybe the doors are locked, right? There's all kinds of different situations that might impact your ability to escape. So I would argue that if you cannot run for whatever reason, that your next best option might be simply to wait out the attack. Get into some area of relative safety and simply wait the attack out. Let the bad guy do whatever it is he's going to do, and when it's over with, you come out, right? Now we call that hiding, and I absolutely hate that terminology, right? Because it implies I want you to be passive, that I want you to get somewhere and I want you just to hope for the best. The reality is I want you to be proactive. I want you to get into some area of safety and I want you to build a physical wall between you and the bad guy. I want you to barricade yourself in that room. I want you to lock that door, then I want you to disable that door so however it functions. Like for example, these doors here, maybe I tie those hydraulic mechanisms on top shut so they don't force open. And then once I do that, I flip every single table and chair and piece of furniture in here in front of that door. I literally build a wall between me and the bad guy. Now barricading rooms is difficult to do if you're not sure how to do it. I do this every day, right? So I can look at a door within a matter of seconds, come up with a plan to barricade it. Most people can't. So you need to figure it out for whatever your situation is. Come up with an idea of how you're going to do it because you only have seconds to do it. And if you're in a room with multiple people, work together, right? Divide and conquer. Now, it's so critical to build that barrier because what we have found is that when our vendors get to a door that they cannot get through easily, right? They encounter an obstacle. They most often will bypass and continue on because they know they have a limited amount of time before somebody gets there to stop them. So they don't want to slow themselves down with that obstacle. Now, exceptions exist, right? Maybe there is someone in that room that they specifically want and they might spend the time trying to break that door down. But generally speaking, that's what we find. Now, once you're in that room, right? Again, I want you to call for help. I understand that if you cannot talk on the phone because you're just too scared, you're worried the bad guy's gonna hear you, right? Any number of reasons if you can't talk, simply leave the phone off the hook. Let that dispatcher eavesdrop in on that open phone call line. Maybe they'll get enough information they can share with the responding officers. Maybe they won't, but it's at least worth you trying. And as ridiculous as it sounds, I want you to remain calm, right? Calm is relative, right? My idea of calm is probably much different than somebody else's in this situation. But it is important that you remain calm, and more important than that is that you keep other people calm. What if you are in that room with somebody else who's hysterical? Maybe that person's crying, they're screaming, they're drawing attention to your location, right? You don't want that, obviously. So how are you going to quiet that person down? Maybe you can talk them down, right? Maybe you can, hey, okay, rationalize, right? you know, reason with them. Slap them across the house. <laughs> Maybe you've got to physically encourage them to be quiet. Yeah, right? It is much better to think about how you're going to do that in this situation, in this environment, than in the environment when you're hiding from the bad guy, right? So it's important that you at least think about that. Think about how you're going to do it if you have to do it.
Because it all comes down to what happens next. What if the bad guy decides he's going to kick your door down, right? What if your barricade doesn't hold as well as you thought it was going to? Or what if you go to make your escape out that door and you run into the bad guy face to face? And now all of a sudden everything has changed. And that brings us to option three. Now, option three is controversial, right? And I've been told I'm wrong. I've been told I should never, ever suggest this to anybody short of military and law enforcement. In fact, there are whole programs out there that do everything they can to discourage people from fighting back, right? I believe it is a possibility. I only believe it is a possibility, though, under certain circumstances, mainly as a last resort. It is when you have no other choices left. If you have another choice, even if that other choice seems like a very bad idea, at least consider that other option, right? And the reason I say that is because it is easy to lose a fight. The bad guy might be bigger than you. He might be stronger than you. He might be faster than you. He might be lucky that day and you might not be, right? It can happen. Now, I told you about Virginia Tech, right? The gunman who had locked the doors, trapped his victims in the building. In one classroom, there was a professor, about a half a dozen students in that classroom. And the professor saw the gunman coming down the hallway towards him. So he went back in his classroom, closed that door. He told his students to jump from the window. The problem is with that is they're on the second floor. So a two-story jump for most of us is probably not the best option, right? Every student jumped. Every student lived. The only person that died in that particular classroom that day was the professor. He stayed behind to fight. He did it, of course, to give time for his students to make that jump, but he paid for it. So that is why I only recommend this as a last resort, because again, it is so easy to lose a fight. Now, if you make that decision, though, you decide you have no other options left, I want you to be as aggressive as you possibly can. I want you to do what is necessary. Now, back in the 90s, I was in Alaska at the time. Now, in his, uh, I was in a mountain survival course, and in this school, our instructors brought this this other guy in to teach us a class on surviving avalanches and this man came in he he's you know probably lived his entire life in the hills of Alaska and he was going to give us a class on exactly what we needed to do if we ever found ourselves in that unique situation so as he's telling us he's telling us that if we ever found ourselves in an avalanche that we would need to fight fight like hell that's what he told us and that is exactly how he told it to us over and over again he screamed at us repeatedly screamed and I thought probably about the same thing that most of you guys are thinking I thought what is wrong with this guy there's no little secret technique or a little gadget or gizmo you're gonna let me carry in my pocket that's gonna let me get through one of these situations right so for about a week or so it was a joke everything was we're gonna fight like this right until my climbing team and I are going up the side of that mountain and I hear a rumble above me and I look up and I see the snowpack shift and as the avalanche starts to come down the side of that mountain at me Guess whose voice I heard in my head? And as that snow buried me, the only voice I heard in my head was this guy screaming at me to fight. So I did exactly as I was told to do. I clawed, I kicked, I dug, I did whatever I thought I needed to do in order to survive that ordeal. I decided I wasn't gonna die that day on that mountain. Sometimes sheer willpower and determination is enough to see you through. Now, of course, there's all kinds of other things you can do to increase your chances, but if you find yourself in a fight for your survival, I don't care if it's against Mother Nature or a guy with a gun, I want you to make up your mind to succeed. If you are scared, if you are tired, if you are hurt, you need to keep going. You need to turn all those emotions into anger, and you need to do whatever is necessary to win that fight. So if that means you need to pick up a chair, a fire extinguisher, a pair of scissors, or anything else you get your hands on, that's what I would expect you to do. And if you're with other people, work as a team. There is absolutely no reason why you ever have to go in this alone. Time and time again, we have seen the fact that sheer numbers can overwhelm a single gunman. We saw it in 2011 in Tucson, Arizona. Gunmen opened fire in a parking lot. There was a political rally going on at that time. The crowd tackled him. The crowd held him down until the police got there. And then more recently on that train in Paris, France, the armed terrorists opened fire and three unarmed Americans stopped him. Yeah, people got hurt. But what's the alternative? Right? The alternative is everybody gets hurt. You might find yourself in this situation, so I want you to be completely informed. Now, I do not recommend fighting back lightly, though. There are consequences to it, right? Again, the physical consequence. You might simply lose. 
But there's also legal consequences, moral so consequences, social, psychological, right? There's all kinds of consequences to using violence to counter violence. But I at least want you to have that complete picture if you find yourself in that situation. Now, I've given you some options, right? Run, hide, fight. And I keep them simple. And the reason I keep them simple is because under stress, the average person can only retain about three to five pieces of information at a time. I can give you a 10 letter acronym, you're not gonna remember it, right? So that's why we keep it easy. But please understand that there is more to those terms than just what the words themselves imply. And I'm also hoping that you want us to get there, right? You want police to deal with the situation so that you don't have to. What helps us the most is information. We have equipment, we have training, we have plans, we know what we're supposed to be doing. The problem is we have no idea what we're dealing with until we're there. And even then we're still trying to figure it out. Information gets us in a better position to deal with the problem more effectively. The most important piece of information, in my opinion, is the location of the attack in the attacker, or the last known location. And this is so critical because if I come to a location that I have never been to before, and if it's particularly big, right, that shopping mall, that school, that hospital, I have to start at the front door and I have to work my way systematically through every office and hallway and stairwell, right? That could take forever. But if you can tell me what floor to go to, if you can tell me what side of the building to go to, if you can tell me what wing to go to, I can bypass everything else that is less likely to be the problem and get to the most likely location where that offender is and I can deal with him more effectively. That's why this becomes so critical for me. Number of attackers is important. Now, I told you 98% of the time lone gunmen, right? Well, what if it's an exception to the rule and you happen to have that piece of information? And a physical description is very critical, not only for me, but very critical for you. The reason I say that is because, let's just be honest, the police officers that show up, they're going to be scared to death. They might not admit it, but they're going to be under a high level of stress. And it's easy to imagine that they encounter somebody and that person has a cell phone or a pair of scissors or anything else in their hand they picked up along the way to defend themselves. That, that police officer can make a bad decision. He could assume that that person is a threat and react. But what we're learning is that when law enforcement has a good physical description in their mind of what that bad guy looks like, they make better decisions when they encounter somebody that doesn't match that description. So a good head-to-toe description is what we're looking for, right? The white male with a shaved head wearing a blue shirt, dark blue jacket, and gray slacks, and hopefully you don't look like the bad guy when you run into the police, right? That allows the police to make better decisions. Now, to help us with this, of course, when you encounter law enforcement, Hold your hands up. Drop everything that you're holding at the time. Verbally tell us you're not the bad guy. We won't believe you, but tell us anyway, right? Mm -hmm. And that's important because in my line of work, I seldom run into people that scream at me, I am not the bad guy, right? It's gonna cause me to stop. It's gonna cause me to react. It's gonna cause me to think. And it's gonna allow me to break out of the stress of the moment and make better decisions, right? And avoid those critical mistakes. Number and type of weapons is also important. If you know in great detail what the bad guy is using for a weapon, I will take that information. If all you know is he holds that weapon in one hand or two hands up to his shoulder, I'll take that too. Right? Any piece of information helps paint that picture of what I might be dealing with. And number of victims at the location is simply about saving lives. It takes time to get resources there. Paramedics, ambulances, life flights, trauma units, all that takes time. If I know I need those resources ahead of time though, going in, I can get them moving to me faster and I can save more people. And what you can expect from law enforcement is critical for you to understand. Right? This is the national standard, meaning every police department in the country that I am aware of follows this exact same guidelines. Now, I'll be perfectly honest with you. Some police departments are better than others. Some police officers are better than others. And we saw that in Florida, right? But generally speaking, the best of my knowledge, the only goal of law enforcement is to stop the bad guy. As soon as we have information that something's going on, we are gonna proceed directly to where we think that bad guy is with the sole purpose of stopping him. We are not there to help you. In fact, I train police officers to step over people that are critically injured in order to continue on and find the bad guy first. Now it sounds like we don't care at all, right? We have to do it this way. 
It's triage. That's the best way I can describe it. Because if those police officers stop and they render first aid to somebody, even if it means saving that person's life in the two minutes it takes them to do that, right? And I'm probably being generous with that, right? In the two minutes it takes them to do that, how many more people are killed by the bad guy? Because I told you these attacks only last five to 10 minutes, right? So two minutes is a very long time. So I save one, but I lose three, four, five, right? That's why we do it this way. Now understand this, of course, right? Help us get to the bad guy faster. Direct us where you think he is so that we can proceed, we can deal with that problem, and then we can come back and render aid to people that need it. We can help people who are trapped, help people evacuate. Also understand there are more police officers coming. There are paramedics coming, firefighters coming, right? They're all coming, but there's going to be a delay between them getting in there. That delay might be minutes. It could be hours in some situations, right? So in that period of time, if you can do something to help somebody else, do it, right? If you know first aid, and I encourage everybody to have that skill set. If you have that skill set, use it. Help somebody. If you don't know first aid, reenact the best episode of whatever medical drama you like to watch on television. Because I don't care if you know first aid or not. I want you to try. Because you might be successful. You might save somebody's life, or at least prolong it, for an extra minute or two until somebody else gets there who has more advanced skills than you. But at least try. If you can help people who are trapped, if you can help people evacuate, do it. Because not only are you helping them, you're also helping yourself. And what I mean by that is every single one of us is going to go through some degree of psychological trauma. Now, for some of us, it might be one or two sleepless nights, and it's like it never happened. For others, it may be much, much more significant. But I believe that if you help somebody, you're going to be in a much better position to deal with the aftermath. Because you're going to know you helped somebody. You're going to know you were part of the solution. Now, I learned about psychological trauma the hard way. Back in 1999 was my first active shooter attack I ever responded to. And in that attack, we did exactly as we were trained to do at the time. And no police officer on my team was physically injured as a result of what we did. Now I say physically injured. Because there were two guys on my team who were traumatized by what they saw and what they did. And we knew it. We knew there was a problem with these guys. And then we did absolutely nothing about it. In fact, we ignored them. I chalked it up as these guys weren't tough. They didn't have the right stuff. They weren't cut out to be cops as far as I was concerned. So we let these guys suffer. And we let these guys suffer for years. Until ultimately we just got rid of them. Don't make the same mistakes that my former agency made. Don't make the same mistakes that I made. Understand that everyone's going to go through this and all it means is that you're human. But you can deal with it. You can manage it. You can overcome it as long as you accept it for being what it is, right? You don't try to deny that it doesn't even exist, right? You have to face it. You have to deal with it. Because for me, knowing what I know now many years later, it's about getting back control of my life. It's about getting back to whatever it is I like to do, right? And I tell people all the time that if they're a victim of violent crime, doesn't matter if it's this kind of violent crime or any other violent crime, the worst thing they can do is go home and be afraid, right? They have to refuse to become that victim. They have to refuse to live in fear. They have to get right back out and get back involved doing whatever it is they want to do because that's how you recover. That's how you get control back over your life. All right, to conclude, I want to leave you guys with this. It may feel like just another day at the office, but occasionally life feels more like an action movie than reality. The authorities are working hard to protect you and to protect our public spaces. Sometimes, bad people do bad things. Their motivations are different. The warning signs may vary, but the devastating effects are the same. And unfortunately, you need to be prepared for the worst. you were 
forever to find yourself in the middle of an active shooter event. Your survival may depend on whether or not you have a plan. The plan doesn't have to be complicated. There are three things you could do that make a difference. Run, hide, fight. First and foremost, if you can get out, do. Always try and escape or evacuate, even when others insist on staying. Encourage others to leave with you, but don't let them slow you down with indecision. Remember what's important, you, not your stuff. Leave your belongings behind and try to find a way to get out safely. Trying to get yourself out of harm's way needs to be your number one priority. Once you are out of the line of fire, try to prevent others from walking into the danger zone and call 911. find a safe room or closet. Try to conceal yourself behind large objects that may protect you. Do your best to remain quiet and calm. As a last resort, if your life is at risk, whether you are alone or working together as a group, fight, act with aggression, improvise weapons, disarm him, and commit to taking the shooter down, no matter what. have an exit plan. Know that in an incident like this, victims are generally chosen randomly. The event is unpredictable and may evolve quickly. The first responders on the scene are not there to evacuate or tend to the injured. They are well trained and are there to stop the shooter. safety and survival. Be aware and be prepared. And if you find yourself facing an active shooter, there are three key things you need to remember to survive. Run, hide, fight. I want to thank everyone for your time and attention. I threw a lot of information at you in a very short amount of time. So on our state website, under our emergency protocols link, there is a companion document for this presentation. It contains a lot of the same information, as well as all those indicators and some more statistics. That information is simply there as a resource for you. As well as you can go to our helpful links and access our YouTube channel and it actually has those two videos that you saw embedded in the presentation. All this is there for you to share with coworkers, family, friends. This is simply a resource for you. Um, in addition to that, before you leave, and I'll leave them out here on the side, is um, we created these small little pocket cards which kind of recap exactly what we were talking about as well as some information. So I have a bunch up here and we'll leave those for you guys as well. Um, with that, I want to open it up. Uh, questions? Anyone that anyone has? <coughs> 